And I want to turn to the very first chapter of the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Uh, if you have a Bible there, let's read together from Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 to verse 20. So Revelation chapter 1 from verse 9. This is the Apostle John writing, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Well, this is God's word, and before we consider this passage together, let's just pause and ask God to speak to us. Shall we pray? Lord God, we do thank you for your word, and we pray that your word would come uh, to our hearts and our minds with great clarity and force and power this morning. We ask that you would speak to us, and that you would help us hear and see the things that you want us to. And so we ask for the powerful inward work of your Holy Spirit to bring this about. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, friends, I think in many situations, perspective is everything. The, the angle you take on things, the way you look at something, the expectations that you have of it, make an enormous difference to how you experience that thing. Uh, if BCE students get a, an ATAR score that devastates them and uh, is far from their dream and their, their dream course is now over, it's so important that they get some perspective on that. Yeah, it's devastating, but life is not over. Uh, if you have kids, uh, kids who have been told all their life that they're amazing, that they're a star, that they're the best, then there's a good chance that those kids eventually are going to struggle to get a bit of perspective on life uh, and a bit of reality about themselves. At home, if if things break, I panic, I, like I can barely fix anything. And so um, 
you know, like the, the vacuum cleaner uh, stops working. And I start to catastrophize about that and feel like everything sucks except the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and you know, at that moment, I need to get a bit of perspective on things. That's why we poke fun at our first world problems, isn't it? We, we realise we need to get a bit of perspective on our tech worries and our food worries and our bad hair day worries. We need perspective. And exactly that is true of the Christian life and church life. We need perspective. And I think there's perhaps no better place to go for perspective than the book of Revelation. Although it's a hard and in some ways obscure book, it's given to the church and it's meant to be understandable and the Lord reveals this. It's a revelation to give us perspective. Often what it gives us is a heavenly perspective or an eternal perspective and it changes everything. And in Revelation chapter 1, right off the bat, John, the apostle of Jesus Christ, is given a revelation of Jesus himself. And this revelation gives tremendous perspective. I think it gives a perspective we desperately need in the Christian life and in church life. A perspective we need if we are going to thrive as followers of the Lord Jesus. And so if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus here this morning, I think the perspectives of Revelation 1 are tremendously helpful and very, very important. And if you're not uh, a follower of the Lord Jesus yet, I'd love you to hear these perspectives and think about them because they m just might change completely the way that you think and view things. The perspective that John, John gives in Revelation chapter 1 gives us a sense of reality. It gives us a sense of majesty. And it gives us a sense of certainty. And that's the perspective I want us to look at this morning. First of all, John gives us a sense of reality. In, uh, uh, I was going to say in January, it's still January, isn't it? Yeah, so this month, it feels like forever ago, this month, uh, my wife and I had a week's holiday in Bright. And uh, it was just beautiful. The weather was flawless. Uh, it's green there. It's lush. The water in the river was warm. We went on endless walks. We ate good food and drank nice coffee and read and read books. And it was just, it was just. I'm, I'm tempted to, uh, to say... Yep, I, I will. Okay, I'm, I'm on this one now. I won't move. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, at times like that, a beautiful holiday, I'm tempted to say, this is really living. This is life. But of course, it's not really living. <laughs> it's a holiday. It's time out from what life is really like. Most of life is quite different from that. And so John speaks of the normal reality in verse 9 when he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. He speaks as our brother and partner. He speaks as one of us. He might be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he is also just an ordinary follower of Jesus. And his experience is basically stock standard Christian experience. 
And it's this. He says, I, I'm a partner with you in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Those three things go together. Uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have become part of his kingdom, Jesus' kingdom. He came to bring his kingdom to the world, and his kingdom is coming. But when you belong to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, these other two things that go either side of it in this sentence go with it. Tribulation and patient endurance. And John says that as an old man. He's probably in his 90s. But he's not in a retirement village. Uh, and he's not traveling the Mediterranean as a gray nomad, exploring some of the beautiful sights. Sure, he's on an island in the Aegean Sea, but it's a prism island. Uh, Patmos was a remote, barren, isolated, mountainous island where people were exiled if they were troublemakers. And John has been exiled there as an old man because of his faith in Jesus. He is experiencing this reality that if you belong to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, then tribulation and with that patient endurance are part of of the package. Those three things, of course, were Jesus' experience, weren't they? He had come to bring his kingdom into this world. He demonstrated in his miracles the power and the presence of his reign and his rule in this world. But he brought that kingdom through suffering. He brought that kingdom via the cross. And the cross called for his patient endurance. As Isaiah prophesied, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter and did not open his mouth. What patient endurance is that? Hebrews 12 says, Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Well, if those things were the experience of John as a follower of Jesus, and if they were an experience of Jesus himself, we should expect that they will be our experience too. In fact, John goes on to write to the seven churches that the Lord has told him to write to, and he keeps talking to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation about exactly these things. Uh, he, he speaks to the seven churches about tribulation and suffering. Have a look at what he says to the church of Smyrna, chapter 2, verse 9. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for 10 days you will have tribulation. He's talking about suffering, tribulation, hardship, slander, difficulty, Satan's opposition to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And repeatedly he talks to those churches then about patient endurance. In fact, right at the start, the letter to Ephesus, uh, he, he says, verse 2 of chapter 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Friends, I want to say this is reality. If you belong to a church that has people in it, <laughs> and you live in a world that does not acknowledge the reign of Jesus Christ, then you can expect that there will be difficulty. There'll be hardship. 
There will be tribulation. Enduring difficulty is par for the course. And I think the problem we often have is that's not our perspective. We, we want church life and Christian life to be easy. We want it to be happy. We want it to be more like a holiday than work. More like a holiday than war. And so we easily get disillusioned. If things go wrong at church, we want to leave. If people ridicule our faith, we want to be silent and be anonymous. If society rejects our values, we feel despair. If we're not feeling happy, we start to question our faith. If things are going badly in our life, we might question God's goodness or God's power. And in a way that's understandable, our hearts long for beauty, for rest, for joy, for peace. And friends, it is coming. <laughs> beauty and joy and peace and pleasure is coming. But God's kingdom has not yet come in all its fullness. And just as Jesus entered his glory via the cross, so we will one day enter glory, enter heaven and eternity, but for now it is via tough stuff and patient endurance. And you know, I think that perspective on Christian life and church life is tremendously helpful. It's just helpful to anchor ourselves in that reality that it's probably going to be hard. You know, I, I could come along and, and give, you know, pump you up with an amazing picture of what 2021 is going to be like. Now I'll tell you what I think 2021 is going to be like. It's probably going to be hard. Um, most of my plans probably won't work out. Uh, I'll probably encounter some frustrations and difficulties at church, uh, at college, at home. <laughs> you didn't get me here to be a pessimist, but I think this is actually realism. And the perspective of reality helps so that when it's hard, we don't give up. That's the first angle a sense of reality. But if we only had that sense of reality, then we, we might actually give up and lose heart. The second thing John is given here is a sense of majesty. A sense of majesty. I wonder what picture you have of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you picture Jesus, how do you see him? At Christmas time, we tend to picture a baby in a manger. At Easter time, we tend to picture a man crucified, nailed to a cross. In the Gospels, we may well picture in our minds some sort of uh, Middle Eastern sandal-wearing nomad walking around with his little group of friends. Maybe you have a sort of a, a, a children's storybook picture of Jesus. He's like gentle. He's kind of sort of a gentle ancient hippie uh, who's probably vegan and ethically responsible. And he, he's, he's a nice guy. Jesus the preacher, Jesus the teacher, Jesus the wise sage, Jesus, the life coach. Well, the Apostle John, writing this, was Jesus' closest earthly friend. He perhaps knew him better than anyone else did. But now, one Sunday 
on the island of Patmos, he sees Jesus like he has never seen him before. John hears a loud voice like a trumpet behind him. He turns to see who it is who is speaking, and there he sees seven golden lampstands, and amongst those candlestands, he sees one whom he says was like a son of man, verse 13. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. Now that is a loaded phrase in the Bible. It's loaded because it's used in an Old Testament prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel 7, there's one like a son of man, which actually means a human, a, a man, a, a person, but a person who's in a very unique situation. In Daniel 7, we read this. I saw in the night visions, Daniel says, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days. That's the name there for God. And he was presented before him. And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And what John is now saying is he's taking up that language and effectively saying, Jesus is that one, like a son of man, who comes before God, the ancient of days, and is given by him all majesty and power and authority. And so everything now in the description of the Son of Man, this picture that John sees, reinforces his power and his majesty and his authority. He's wearing long robes with a golden sash, which is reflective of the, 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 um, the clothing of a, an Old Testament priest. Je- Jesus, the son of, one like a son of man, is a priestly figure. His hair, we're told, is white like wool, white as snow. Now, that, that doesn't so much mean he's old as it's taking up again the description in Daniel 7 where just before the verses I read, it speaks of God, the ancient of days, with hair that is white like wool. So now Jesus is being described as looking like God himself. Next we're told that his eyes are blazing fire. Eyes that pierce and penetrate and see burn into your soul. And then we're told that his feet are like glowing bronze, which is a symbol of his purity, refined, holy feet that walk in purity. Next we're told in this description, Uh, We're at the end of verse 15 now. His voice was like the roar of many waters. Before we we told that that John heard a voice that was like a loud trumpet. Now we're told it's like the roar of many waters. Maybe you've stood uh, on a a cliff or on on rocks at the edge of a sea that is pounding. And it's loud, isn't it? You have to shout, isn't that amazing? You have to shout to be heard over the roar of the waters. And the voice of Jesus is said to be like that. Next, we're told from his mouth, this this mouth that speaks so powerfully, from his mouth comes a double-edged sword, a symbol of judgment. And then finally, in verse 16, it says, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. You know that you're not meant to look at the sun because it will burn your retinas. 
when there's a solar eclipse, eclipse we're told don't, don't look directly at the sun. It's too brilliant for our eyes to handle. And that now is the depiction used of the face of Jesus. His face so radiant, so glorious, so splendid that you cannot look fully into his majesty. Little wonder that we are told in the next verse, John fell down as though dead. This is not how he remembers Jesus. Not even at the transfiguration had he seen Jesus like this. This is not Jesus the Galilean or Jesus the carpenter's son. This is not Jesus the rabbi or even Jesus the, the preacher or healer. This is not Jesus the man on the cross. This is Jesus now exalted, enthroned. This is the majestic Jesus, who is Lord of all, who is the Son of God. I suspect many of us have too small a view of Jesus. Our Jesus is meek and mild, and he wouldn't scare anyone. In fact, maybe in a nice little bit of heresy, we kind of think of Jesus as the nice one of the Trinity. God, you know, God the Father, he's kind of stern and a bit scary. And the Holy Spirit is kind of very ethereal and a bit hard to get a grip on. But Jesus, like, well, Jesus is very approachable. Jesus is our friend. Maybe, you know, Jesus could almost be our mate. And here's the tension we have to hold. Jesus is the friend of sinners. Jesus came into this world to be one of us, to be approachable, to be near us. And yet, the Lord Jesus who came to love us and live for us and die for us has been, ascent, has been raised from the dead, seated in heavenly glory, and he is majestic beyond imagination. He is crowned with honor and glory. He wields supreme power and authority. He's the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who is in charge of life and death. And God has appointed him as CEO of the universe. And that perspective is essential for us if we are to live for him today. You know, if we have a small view of Jesus, we'll have small faith. We'll have small courage. We'll make only small commitments to Christ. But if we have a picture of Jesus that is massive, if we see him with all his power and majesty and glory and authority, we will be moved to worship him and serve him and speak of him and commit to him because of who he is. Maybe you can picture the, uh, the enormous statue of Jesus that towers over Rio de Janeiro. You know that, that huge statue called Christ the Redeemer? It's, it's massive. Uh, it's a statue of Jesus with outstretched arms. The, the statue stands 38 meters tall. That's huge. That's like a 12-story building. The, the head is 3.7 meters tall. All right, that's one big head. Yep. The arms wide open. They're massive. And that statue in Rio de Janeiro was designed after World War I 
when there was concern that Brazil, which had become a, public in the late, a republic in the late 19th century, was becoming increasingly godless. And so devout Catholics wanted to stir devotion to Jesus Christ. And they thought that by making the statue and placing it over the city, they would stir commitment and renewed devotion to Jesus. And because that was their goal, they went big. They went very big. But they did not go anywhere big enough. They, they just built a, a concrete statue, covered it in mosaic tiles that are falling off, and the back of his head has been singed by lightning strikes. We need not a, not a statue, not a picture of Jesus, no matter how big it is. We need what God's word has given us here in Revelation 1. A picture of the majesty and the power and the authority of Jesus Christ that is beyond our comprehension. We need a Jesus who's worth serving and who we should talk about and for whom it is worth even suffering. But now, if we have the two things I've mentioned so far, a sense of reality, yep, life's going to, probably going to be hard, and a sense of majesty, the glory and the splendor of Jesus, if we have those two things, it might just be that we feel paralyzed. John himself, as we've seen, is, is rocked to the core by the vision of Jesus. But he's given a third thing that he needed and that we need as well, and that is a sense of certainty. A sense of certainty. I don't know about you, but I hate uncertainty. I really like to know what's happening, and that's a big problem because life is full of uncertainty. If you live in Melbourne, you never know what the weather is going to be. If you live in the world during a pandemic, <laughs> You just never know anything about anything, really, do you? We, we don't know what the year's going to be like. You don't know about work. You don't know about travel. You don't know about where you can meet. You don't know about school. You don't know about health. We live with unbelievable uncertainty. But this vision gives to us certainty about two things. First of all, there's certainty. That Jesus is sovereign over everything. Sovereign over all the uncertainties of our lives. Sovereign over health, sovereign over politics, sovereign over work, sovereign over every part of our life. And this vision wasn't given to scare John, it was given to comfort him, actually. I love the way after it said that John fell to his feet as though dead, Jesus, this majestic, glorious Savior, comes and, it says, laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I did hide, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. He's saying to his children, Don't fear, I am in control. I am sovereign. Look at my majesty. Look at my glory. I will exercise this on your behalf. You are my people. I love you. I can uphold you. I can rescue you. I can save you. He has the keys of death and Hades. He can unlock the grave. John faces the possibility of martyrdom. He's writing to churches where some people will die for their faith. And Jesus says, don't worry, I have the keys to death and Hades. They kill you, I can unlock the grave and give you life everlasting because I live forevermore. We're told that we can only be certain about death and taxes. But the Christian is certain about death and taxes and everlasting life. 
that beyond the tax regime and beyond the grave, there is eternal hope. I love the way the, uh, the book of Romans puts this. In Romans chapter 8, listen to these beautiful words where it speaks about this certainty. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, all the realities that we may face. Then it says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, here's gospel certainty, I am sure that neither life nor death, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a wonderful certainty that is. Friends, it doesn't matter what comes to you this year. Jesus Christ is sovereign over it. He is Lord. And even if this year is the year we are taken from this world, there is the hope of everlasting life because of the resurrection of Jesus. And then there's a second certainty here, and it's the certainty that Jesus is present with us now. Jesus is present with us now. He walks among us the seven golden lampstands, and we're told that the lampstands represent the seven churches. Churches are uh, to brightly shine the light of the gospel in the world, and Jesus walks among those lampstands. Jesus is amongst, in the midst of his church. And we're told he holds in his right hand the seven stars, and then we're told that the stars are the angels of the seven churches. Which could be, could, could mean, because angel basically just means messenger, it could be the ministers, the leaders. He holds the leaders of the churches in his hands. Most scholars think, though, that it's probably heavenly representatives of those churches, actual angels that protect and watch over the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Either way, it's a picture that Jesus holds those churches in his hands. When Christ ascended to heavenly glory, he did not abandon us. But rather, by the power of his word and spirit, he is with us. He's amongst us. He's in our midst. He's upholding us. And if you read the seven letters that he now writes to the churches, you'll see that Jesus knows the church through and through. Jesus knows every Every challenge of this church, every problem, every worry, every burden, every difficulty, the Lord Jesus knows that thoroughly. It's it's not shocking to him or surprising. He knows your church life better than you know it. And he knows every strength of this church, every act of service, all your faithfulness, your commitment to the word and to the gospel, Jesus knows that through and through. He is able to diagnose every problem. He is able to remedy every difficulty. In fact, in the letters that follow, a little piece of this vision is spoken to each church. To Ephesus... It's the words of him who walks among the lampstands. To Smyrna, it's the words of the first and the last. To Pergamum, it's the works of him, the words of him who has a sharp, double-edged sword. And so the point is, what the Lord speaks to his church comes from who he is. What we most need is Jesus Christ himself, his power, his strength, his purity, 
His love, His presence. Our hope is not in our strategic plans or in our leaders or in our confessions or in our history. Our hope is in Jesus Christ himself, the Lord of the church. So run to him with your sins and he will forgive you. Turn to him with your burdens and he will carry them for you. Confide in him your fears. And as with John, he'll, as it were, lay his hand on you and say, fear not. Seek his wisdom and he will guide you. Depend on his power and he will strengthen. Friends, as you launch into this new year, what would it be like if you lived with this perspective on life? Imagine if we lived as individuals and as a church with this sense of reality. Yes, it's probably going to be hard. There will probably be difficulties and there will be a lot of stuff that we just have to patiently endure. That's reality. But the kingdom of God is coming and it's worth enduring. And what would it be like if we lived with a greater sense of the majesty of Jesus Christ? He is enthroned as Lord of all. He's sovereign over all things and therefore over everything that we encounter this year. He's the first and the last. He's the ruler of all. And so finally, what would it be like if we lived with a great sense of certainty, absolutely sure that Jesus holds life and death in his hands and we're safe with him, absolutely sure that he is present with us. He knows us, he loves us, and he himself is the remedy for every challenge we face. Perspective is everything. And this is the perspective God gives us that we might thrive as followers of Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer before him now. Lord Jesus, we stand in awe before you. We cannot imagine how great you are, but we believe that you are Lord of all and Lord of the church. We believe that you have been enthroned on high, that yours is the kingdom and the power and the majesty and the glory forever. And so we pray that that perspective might shape the way that we live this week, this year. Give us a deep sense of reality. Give us a profound sense of your majesty. And dear Lord, please give us absolute certainty that no matter what we face, you are with us. We thank you so much for that. In your precious name. Amen.